1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 26 is where we'll begin reading in just a moment. This morning, uh, we'll continue on our uh, lessons of mastering our emotions. This morning, looking specifically at the emotion of inferiority, feeling inferior. Many people struggle with feelings of inferiority. Psychiatrists have identified what they call the inferiority complex. These are uh, feelings, uh, people that have, will have them all of the time. And they make people feel that um, no matter what, that they're useless, that they're stupid, or that someone else is better qualified. You may know somebody that always feels that way. They'll, they'll never volunteer to do something or they uh, don't speak out very much in a crowd because they always feel that they're too dumb. Or, or uh, you may know someone like that or you, you may uh, be that way yourself. Psychologists have also... Uh, traced the superiority complex, which would be uh, someone who always feels like they're better, or they feel like um, uh, they're uh, uh, entitled above everyone else. You could think of maybe someone like Adolf Hitler, who believed that there was a master race and that they were better than everyone else and they were killing the Jews. Psychologists have uh, traced that complex back to a root feelings of inferiority. So I just want us to see this morning that many people struggle with feeling like they're no good that they're dumb or that they're stupid. There was a preacher who was feeling a little discouraged, so he asked his wife, Honey, how many good preachers do you think there are in the world? She said, I don't know, but there's probably one less than you think there are. What a letdown. If we're not careful, we can get down in the dumps with feelings of uselessness and feelings of uh, inability. Too often Christians believe that they are no good and that they're second rate and they're embarrassed that they go to church or they're embarrassed that they serve the Lord and that they're Christians. And if you're saved this morning, you have a first class ticket, but too many of us are living like we're fifth class passengers. Paul wrote concerning the topic of inferiority in our text. We'll read uh, verse 26 down to the end of the chapter. The Bible says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Verse 28 says, And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. God can and wants to use the all-American athlete. He wants to use the Grammy award-winning artist. He wants to use the Harvard graduate, but the truth of the matter is, most of us in this room this morning are just ordinary people. But the fact is that God most often uses ordinary people who live seemingly pedestrian lives to work his extraordinary work. How, what better work could we do than to share the gospel with others, share the living word, share the way to heaven, the way to eternal security? But yet, God often doesn't choose the most talented or the most uh, skilled, as we might say, according to the world standard. He often uses ordinary people. I want us to notice the apostles. Think of the uh, Peter, James, and John and all these men who followed Christ. They weren't learned men. and They weren't uh, scholars. They were a ragtag group of men, but they turned the world upside down with the gospel. What occupations were they? Fishermen? tax collector, there was a zealot, just a crazy man, but yet God used them to spread the gospel, the Bible says, to the ends of the world. Others commented when they saw uh, Peter and John, they said in Acts 13 that they were ignorant and unlearned, but I want to read the total verse. Acts 4.13 says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. These men realized that, you know what, these might not be the smartest guys. They might just be a couple of fishermen. They might be a little rough around the edges. But they marveled. They took note. Why? Because there was something different about them. Was it their intellect or was it their physical stature? No, it was the fact that they had been with Jesus. 
They could tell that they weren't the smartest, yet they knew something was different about them. If we are going to banish, if we are going to get rid of and overcome feelings of inferiority, whether it be in ourselves or maybe with someone in our family that we can help, then we need to understand a couple of things this morning, and we'll look at those uh, starting right now. So number one, we need to understand that God uses ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. Verse 27 of our text, the Bible says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. This morning, uh, if you're simple, if you're plain, if you're common, ordinary, vanilla, you can go on and on, run of the mill, dime a dozen, God can use you. The word foolish in this verse is derived from the Greek word moros. That sounds very much like another word that you might recognize. It's the same word that we get our word moron. And that word literally means non-intelligent. Paul was trying to illustrate the usability and the ability of all sorts of different people. God can use the most intelligent and he can use the least intelligent. I watched a little show uh, on YouTube the other day. It was uh, uh, Tom Brady and a couple of other athletes. They were in a round table and they were discussing uh, different things that they had learned along their careers that they thought had made them successful. And obviously some of the other men uh, were some basketball players. There was a golfer, but none more decorated than Tom Brady, uh, who has been to 10 Super Bowls, won seven, and uh, has all of the accolades top to bottom. And the thing that he said that made him the probably the most successful, is that he quickly realized his weaknesses. He said, I, people you know, make fun of me whenever I was running the 40-yard the dash at the combine because I looked goofy and I was slow, and I believe he ran slower than uh, a lot of linemen that were in his class. Okay, Much bigger, much heavier guys, and he was slower than them. And he said, I'm not the strongest guy on the field. He said, I'm not the fastest. But he said, the one thing that I've learned I can do really well is throw a football. And he said, if I just focus on doing that, I'll let my coaches and the scouts put guys around me who can run faster than me, who are stronger than me, who are bigger than me. And he said, when I just focus on working on my strength, which is throwing a football, and I let everyone else make up for my weaknesses, then that often puts us in a position to win. The same thing is true with us as Christians. Those of us who feel inadequate or maybe we feel stupid or like we can't be used because we have all kinds of weaknesses, those kind of people God can use and they have often greater potential to be more successful because we are aware of our limitations and we therefore can depend more on God to make up for our lack of strength. So before we move on to the next part, I want us to see a couple, I want to make a little asterisk on God uses ordinary people. I want us to notice two things. God uses ordinary people, but it doesn't say that God doesn't use any mighty, and it doesn't say that he doesn't use any noble. Let's read verse 26 again. The Bible says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, and not many mighty, and not many noble are called. Praise the Lord for the, the PhDs, the entertainers, the athletes, the celebrities, the businessmen, the successful people of the world who choose to live for the Lord. I believe that Paul was one of the mighty that the Bible mentions here in this verse. Paul was a man of uh, background. He was a man of social standing. We know that Paul was extremely educated. If you've ever read any of the uh, epistles and the books in the New Testament that Paul wrote, they can get wordy and they can get kind of hard to understand. And whenever I'm studying any of those letters, often you have to read them two, three, four times to really kind of completely understand what he's saying. Paul wasn't a dummy. He had a lot of education. Some say that maybe he had as much as a equivalent to a, a triple PhD, much more than, than my education goes. And Paul was very experienced. God employed Paul's exceptional gift uh, on for his purpose. We know that Paul was working against the Lord and God knocked him off his uh, donkey on the road to Damascus and he said, I need this guy working for me. So we see that if you do have some exceptional talents and you do have some strengths, don't use that and say, well, God will use the ordinary ones. Well, God wants to use the smart ones too. He wants to use the swift and the strong, but often those 
people are too puffed up. They're not relying on God, and God then will use the weak and those who are not as maybe exceptional. God says if we won't open our mouth to praise the Lord, that he'll use the rocks. He doesn't need us, but God chooses to use us. We'll get into that in just a minute. So I want us to note that, and then also, God doesn't want us to accept laziness and mediocrity. God uses ordinary people, but don't use that as a crutch and say, well, I don't got to read any books. I don't got to study the Bible. God um, dispels that in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. God said, whatever you have, I want it. I want you to do the best, and I don't want you to settle for uh, mediocre. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're not the most intelligent, you still need to study. Don't just say, well, you know, I can't understand the Bible. God says that we ought to study to show ourselves approved. Not a workman in the, necessarily uh, in, the, in the office on Monday, but whenever we open the Bible, that we can talk intelligently. What a terrible testimony to have, that if someone would come to us at the workplace or at the grocery store or wherever and ask us a Bible question, and as a Bible believer, as a member of Roger City Baptist Church, we can't answer it because we're too lazy to dig into the Word of God. That's a poor testimony to have for Christ. We ought to be able to, as the Bible says, give an answer to every man. So don't crutch on being an ordinary person. Study and work and try to be the best that you can be, knowing that God will make up for your lack of abilities. So we see, first of all, that God uses ordinary people. But number two, how is it possible for God to use ordinary people? Number two is God's extraordinary power. God can use ordinary people because of his extraordinary power. Uh, verse 30 of our text, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God makes up for what we lack. He is our wisdom. God is our righteousness. God's our sanctification. And praise the Lord, God is our redemption this morning. God who formed the world with a word, the God who holds the king's heart in his hand, and the God whose voice, the winds and the seas obey, wants to channel his power through you this morning. He wants to channel his power through me. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 and the, the first part of that verse says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. God wants to live in you and to work through you. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the last verse, Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God wants to use you this morning, and God doesn't want to use your abilities. He wants to make you like a pipe this morning. He wants to channel his power through you. The Bible says that our righteousnesses, the best things that we can do, they're just filthy rags. They're just nasty. But if we allow God to channel his power through us, we can do amazing works. God doesn't want you to be inhibited by your own weakness, but he wants you to be inhabited with his supernatural power. A, a, an example of a weak man who was able to do an amazing task because of God's power would be Gideon. Judges chapter 6 and verse 11 says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah, that pertained to Joash the Abizrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. We skip down to verse 15, the Bible says, this is Gideon talking to the Lord. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. In other words, Gideon said, of all the tribes, Manasseh is the worst one. And of all of the families that are in Manasseh, my family is the poorest. And out of my family, I am the runt of the litter. How am I a mighty man of valor? I'm literally the least of the least of the least. But we see that God used Gideon in a 
army of 300 men to defeat an army of well over 42,000 men. How did he do that? The answer is in Judges 6 and verse 34. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. That phrase, came upon, literally means clothed in. It was no longer Gideon that was acting. It was God that put on the shell of Gideon and he was working through him. God will do the same to you. God will come in, he will clothe himself in you and work wonders that are literally unlimited as long as we allow him to do so. And lastly, I want to see not only that God uses ordinary people and that God has extraordinary power, but I want to see God's reason. Why does God use ordinary people? Why does God operate that way? The answer is in uh, verse 29 of our text, 1 Corinthians 1, 29. I want us to look at it all together. The Bible says that no flesh should glory in his presence. God uses ordinary people. Why? So that he gets the glory. Heaven's not going to be a talent show. When we get to heaven, we're not going to uh, enroll in a contest and try to see you know, who has the best voice and who can do the, the best this and that. God saves us by his grace and not through our works. God doesn't hinge our eternal security on anything that we do. If, we were, if it were to be that way, if it were that Jesus Christ died for us, but then also that we go to church, or also that we share the gospel, or also that we do good works, then we would be co-saviors with Christ because we would have something to do with our salvation making us as important to our going to heaven as Jesus was. And we know that that just makes absolutely no sense. It's completely contrary to scripture. But God saves us by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Nothing else added. Why? So that it's not a contest. So it's not a show. So that, you know, Brother Ray's better at this, so he might have a better standing with the Lord, or he might have a better chance of going to heaven because of what he can do. That's not how God works. It's an even playing field. The Bible says that all we have to do to go to heaven is to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that we shall be saved. Heaven's not a talent show. Otherwise, we would be like the woodpecker who was pecking at his tree when all of a sudden, out of the blue, a lightning bolt came and struck his tree and split the tree in half. A few days later, he was soon seen with a group of nine other woodpeckers and he said, gentlemen, there it is, right over there. We think that's absurd. That woodpecker did not split that tree in half with his own power. It was of uh, amazing extra power, but he was taking credit for something that he didn't do. That's what it's like when we take credit for things that the Lord does in us. We're just ordinary people allowing God's extraordinary power to work through us to be able to bring people to salvation, to be able to reach others with the gospel, to be able to uh, help families that are broken. And I, I love looking around and seeing those who I can't help of always using Brother Ray in this example. Somebody who um, I never thought would be saved. Somebody who I thought would never come to church, who would never want anything to do with the Lord, and yet for the last, what is it, 11 or 12 years, been coming to church faithfully, been serving the Lord, and that just blows my mind every Sunday that I see him walk in. I think of all the times when Dad said, well, I'm going to go witness to Ray Calhoun. I just would roll my eyes and say, what a waste of time. We go see this guy every other week. He either doesn't answer the door, or he doesn't show any interest. But the Lord was able to bring Brother Ray to salvation. Not because of pastor's amazing ability with words, not because of anything that any of us did, but because of his extraordinary power. I want us to understand this morning that if you have feelings of inferiority, you think, oh, I can't serve the Lord because I'm just not good enough. The only measuring stick that we measure our lives by is the Lord Jesus Christ. And measured to him, we're all inferior. We all don't have anything exceptional. But we can all glory in Christ, and we can all do as much for the Lord as we allow him to do through us. This morning, you are only limited with what you can do through the, for the Lord, with what you allow the Lord to do through you. The only thing that's holding you back from maybe winning your neighbor or uh, being a better witness or uh, helping those who have uh, needs and broken homes is how much you allow the Lord to inhabit you and to work through you. Allow God to live in you this morning. Allow him to live through you. And no matter what you do, 
you'll never be inferior again. Lifetime of labor is still worth.